for news and bespoke analysis. It's good to have you again with us. On the show tonight, protest spiral in Hong Kong trigger a global alarm. India tells a UN meeting in Geneva that concerns about Hong Kong must be properly, seriously and objectively addressed. Also on the show, a shot in the arm for the Indian Air Force. Defense Minister Rajnath Singh clears acquisition of platforms and equipment worth nearly 40,000 crore rupees for the Indian Armed Forces. We get you a 360 degree perspective on that. Plus, President Putin of Russia can stay in power until 2036 after Russians endorse the constitutional change. We get you a ground report. All that and much, much more coming up over the next 60 minutes. But first, as always, the headlines. In line with Prime Minister Narendra Modi's call for a self-reliant India, Defence Ministry approves proposals worth nearly 40,000 crore rupees. Also approves the acquisition of 33 new fighter aircraft, including 21 MiG-29s and 12 Sukhoi-30 MKIs. Prime Minister Modi congratulates President Vladimir Putin of Russia for successfully completing the vote on constitutional amendments. Both leaders agree on the importance of closer India-Russia ties in post-COVID world. Indian Foreign Ministry reiterates stand on ban on 59 apps, says India is an open society and companies have to follow privacy rules. Also says India and China are for a stepwise but expeditious disengagement from the face-off along the LAC. Communications, Electronics and IT Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad likens India's decision to ban 59 apps to a digital strike. He was addressing a virtual rally for West Bengal. India calls on relevant parties to properly, seriously and objectively address concerns about developments in Hong Kong. Says it is keeping a close watch on the situation as protests spiral there. Home Minister Amit Shah chairs a meeting to devise a unified COVID-19 strategy for the national capital region. Emphasizes on more tests using rapid antigen kits. Chief Ministers of Delhi, UP and Haryana take part via video conference. <music> Government allows private doctors to prescribe coronavirus tests. Recovery rate touches 59.51%. 2.26 lakh active cases in the country. Over 3.59 lakh discharged. 17,834 dead. HRD Minister Ramesh Pokhriyal Nishank sets up a panel to decide the feasibility of conducting NEET and JE examinations in July. This after parents and students alike raise concerns about holding of the exams. And good news on the economic front, UPI payments hit an all-time high of 134 crore transactions in June, worth nearly 2.62 lakh crore rupees. All right, then let's get started. First up, Defence Minister Rajnath Singh on Thursday chaired a Defence Acquisition Council meeting. He approved the purchase of platforms and equipment for the Indian Armed Forces. Now, in that meeting, proposals worth nearly 40,000 crore rupees were approved. It included acquisitions from in an industry worth more than 30,000 crore rupees. The equipment are to be manufactured in India with the participation of the MSMEs as vendors. Now, with the acquisition of the Pinaka missile systems, it will enable India in raising new regiments. Similarly, the induction of Astra missiles having the beyond visual range capability will serve as a force multiplier. They will add to the strike capability of the Navy and the Air Force. Also approved were the proposals for the purchase of 21 MiG-29 jets, upgradation of 59 MiG-29 aircraft, and the purchase of 12 Su-30 MKI aircraft. 
This will address a long felt need to increase the IF's fighter squadrons. Right, here's a quick backgrounder explaining the Astra and Pinaka missile defense systems. Let's talk about the Astra system first. Now, it is the beyond visual range class of air to air missile system. It's designed to be mounted on fighter aircraft and the engage and destroy highly maneuvering supersonic aircraft. And it has an all weather day and night capability. And now to the Pinaka weapons system. Now, all weather day, in fact, let's go to the yeah, weapon systems, all weather indirect fire free flight artillery rocket system. It accurately delivers devastatingly lethal and responsive fire against a variety of area targets. It consists of a rocket, a multi barrel rocket launcher, a battery command post, loader come replenishment vehicle, replenishment vehicle, and a Digicora MET radar. All right, let's, uh, let me just read out the first graphic once again. That's to do with the Astra missile system. It is a beyond visual range class of air-to-air -air missile system. And is designed to be mounted on fighter aircraft. Also, it engages and destroys highly maneuvering supersonic aircraft. And it is an all-weather day and night capability. All right, uh, let's get you the latest on this developing story. Right, my colleague Nandita Dagar joins us live for this uh, story. Nandita, help our viewers understand the significance of the decisions arrived at the meeting today. development Abhishek, right. especially when it comes in the wake of uh, whatever is happening, the standoff or the mm -hmm. uh, uh, standoff that continues at the line of actual control. Although these um, proposals were pending for a long time, but it's just that they are being handled with a lot more urgency now, right. uh, keeping in mind uh, the threat that China poses uh, across the LAC. Also, in the case of a two-front war, mm -hmm. uh, Indian planners had always envisaged, Abhishek, that we should be having a squadron strength of 42 squadrons for the Air Force. Currently, we are down to around 30 uh, right. when the availability or serviceability is low and uh, the maximum that we reach is 32. Mm -hmm. Now, with the acquiring of the, this uh, 21 MiG-29 fighter jets, also, uh, you know, about 12 new Sukhois, which would be almost a squadron, and the upgradation of 59 Sukhois, no, sorry, 59 uh, Sukhoi MKIs, with the, that, would, that would receive a boost, uh, those numbers would go higher. In the case of a two-front two war, which would be, um, which is uh, adequate and which is desired. Also, the emphasis on Make in India. Now, this is not the first time that the Defence Ministry has emphasized on Make in India. Ever since the Defence Procurement Procedures Guidebook, uh, which was released by the, the then Defence Minister Manohar Parikar, you know, that came into being in 2016, February. Ever since that, Indian Defence uh, uh, Defence Ministry has always favoured the indigenous defense environment or industry before uh, it looks to the foreign ones. So it envisages uh, this make in India and now what the clarion call that the Prime Minister has given for Atma Nirbhar Bharat uh, which, which means self-reliance and self-reliance in defense was one of the core objectives of make in India program. Also uh, if you look at, look at this uh, Piraka uh, multi barrel rocket right. launcher system for the army as the artillery as well as right. uh, this Astra Beyond Visual Range Missile System are all indigenous. They are built, and designed, and developed Indeed. by the DRDO. The, and they were also test fired last year. Uh, for example, the Astra was test fired from a Sukhoi. Right. It was a user trial. And also the Pinaka. Which all right, fired uh, fair point, yes. Nandisa. You spoke about the indigenization, the emphasis on indigenization and make in India in that meeting there. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. All right, time for a very short break. Don't go anywhere. Keep watching Newsnight.
I am Rohit Dutta. I am the first corona patient in Delhi. I contacted COVID somewhere in Europe during my business trip to Europe. Uh, I was tested positive on the 1st of March. जब उनको पता चल गया कि मैं पॉजिटिव हूँ तो उन्होंने इतना वंडरफुली एक्ट किया एक तो मुझे नहीं बताया रात को दूसरा उन्होंने मुझे इमीडिएटली शिफ्ट किया और of the constitutional amendments. Now, President Putin will visit India later this year for the annual bilateral summit. Russians have made it possible for President Putin to stay in power till 2036 by approving a constitutional change that allows him to run for two more six-year terms after the current one ends in 2024. That means 67-year-old Putin could rule under, until the age of 83. Here's a detailed report. A historic vote that threw up a historic though expected decision. According to Russian election officials, almost 78% of voters in Russia have approved amendments to the country's constitution that will allow President Vladimir Putin to stay in power until 2036 after all the votes were counted. In the week-long balloting that concluded on Wednesday, 77.9% voted for the changes and 21.3% voted against. The turnout exceeded 64% according to officials. The reported numbers reflect the highest level of voter support for Putin in 10 years. In the 2018 presidential election, 76.7% .7 of voters supported his candidacy, while in the 2012 election only 63.6% .6 did. However, Russians differed in their views on the constitutional vote, some praising the leader and some doubting the results of the vote. I think it is all fake. No one voted. Well, half of the people are against it, others are not. I think the only part I don't like is the reset of the presidential terms, Tally. My attitude to the vote is very positive. I voted for the amendments to the constitution of the Russian Federation. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Narendra Modi spoke on phone with Russian President Vladimir Putin. This was their first interaction after the historic constitutional vote. The conversation was essentially uh, for Prime Minister congratulated President Putin on the successful celebrations marking the 75th anniversary of the victory in the Second World War. And he also congratulated President Putin on the successful completion of the vote on constitutional amendments in Russia. The annual bilateral summit, which is to be held in India later this year, also came up for discussion. And Prime Minister conveyed his keenness to welcome President Putin in India for the bilateral summit. On his part, President Putin reiterated his commitment to further strengthen the special and privileged strategic partnership between the two countries in all spheres. The leaders also discussed the measures undertaken by the two countries to address the negative consequences of the COVID-19 global pandemic and agreed on the importance of closer India-Russia ties for jointly addressing the challenges of the post-COVID world. Prime Minister also congratulated President Putin on the success of celebrations marking the 75th anniversary of the victory in the Second World War. Remember, Raksha Mantri attended the Grand Parade last month. An Indian contingent was part of the military parade held in Moscow on 24 June 2020 as a symbol of friendship between India and Russia. However, some Kremlin critics say the numbers alone show they are false. Putin's approval rating was at 59% in May, according to the Levada Center, Russia's top independent pollster. That was the lowest in two decades. For the first time in Russia, polls were kept open for an entire week to bolster turnout and avoid election day crowds amid the coronavirus pandemic, a provision that Kremlin critics denounced as an extra tool to manipulate the outcome as ballot boxes remained unattended for days at night. News Night Desk, DD India. Now, voting for the referendum was held over seven days. The turnout was 65%. Our Moscow correspondent Lucy Taylor has more. The Kremlin says this result is testament to public trust in President Vladimir Putin. But the campaign over the last few weeks has focused on almost anything else other than extending his time in office. This change to the constitution was bundled up with hundreds of other amendments into a single package which was offered to voters with one yes or no question to approve them all. And those other amendments were wide and varied in topic, ranging from enshrining a faith in God into the <coughs> constitution to outlawing gay marriage, guaranteeing a minimum wage and boosting pensions. 
and critics say that it was designed deliberately to distract attention away from what they describe as a power grab. The results show that more than three quarters of Russians have approved uh, these changes to the constitution. That means that President Vladimir Putin will now be allowed to stand for a further two terms in office if he chooses to do so. It will also give him criminal immunity for life. And now to the other big story we're tracking on Newsnight. For the second consecutive summer, political unrest has returned to the streets of Hong Kong. Hundreds of protesters were arrested after China's government imposed a national security law over the semi-autonomous city. Hong Kong's police fired water cannon and tear gas as protesters took to the streets in defiance of the sweeping security legislation introduced by China to snuff out dissent. Protests broke out in Hong Kong as first arrests were made under new security law on Wednesday. The number later increased to more than 300, including 10 under China's new national security law. Thousands defied a ban on protest on the anniversary of the city's handover to China. Hong Kong police fired water cannon and tear gas as protesters took to the streets in defiance of sweeping security legislation introduced by China to snuff out dissent. Titled The Law of the People's Republic of China on Safeguarding National Security in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, the legislation was unanimously passed by the Chinese parliament and subsequently made a part of Hong Kong's basic law. The new law includes the following as offences, secession, subversion, terrorist activities and collusion with a foreign country or with external elements to endanger national security. The move has sparked international condemnation. The British government said it would offer a path to citizenship for eligible Hong Kong residents, calling the new law a threat to city's freedom. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said China's imposition of a security law on Hong Kong violated Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy. It violates Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy and is in direct conflict with Hong Kong basic law. The law also threatens the freedoms and rights protected by the joint declaration. We made clear, Mr Speaker, that if China continued down this path, we would introduce a new route for those with British national overseas status to enter the UK. Authorities in Beijing and Hong Kong have repeatedly said the legislation is aimed at a few troublemakers and will not affect rights and freedom nor investors' interests. US, along with several Hong Kong activists, have decreed China's national security law imposed in Hong Kong as a brutal crackdown that violates the agreement made under the one country, two systems model of governance. Free Hong Kong was one of the world's most stable, prosperous and dynamic cities. Now, now it will be just another communist run city where its people will be subject to the party elite's whims. The law is a brutal, sweeping crackdown against the people of Hong Kong intended to destroy the freedoms they were promised. Given the large Indian community presence in Hong Kong, India has been keeping a close watch on the recent developments. India reacted on development in Hong Kong, hoping that the concerned parties will take into account these views and address them properly, seriously and objectively. Given the large Indian community that makes the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of China its home, India has been keeping a close watch on recent developments. We have heard several statements expressing concern on these developments. We hope the relevant parties will take into account these views and address them properly, seriously and objectively. Concerned about the situation in Hong Kong, Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison said his government was considering an offer of safe haven to Hong Kong residents Japan is also watching events in Hong Kong with great interest. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Tsuga said Japan's close business ties with Hong Kong were based on its one country, two systems governance. We are considering uh, very actively in the proposals uh, that I asked to be brought forward several weeks ago um, and the filing touches are being put on those and they'll soon be considered by Cabinet um, to provide similar opportunities. Uh, and we think that's important and very consistent with who we are as a people and very consistent practically with the views that we've expressed. For a second summer in a row, political unrest has returned to the streets of Hong Kong. 
Protesters and police also clashed in May and June after the security law was proposed. Last summer, anti-government protests were sparked by strong opposition to a proposed extradition law. The legislation gives Beijing extensive powers it has never had before to shape life in the territory far beyond the legal system. The imposition of new security law drew condemnation from across the world. News Night Desk, DD India. All right, time now for our In Focus segment, Hong Kong Remains on Edge. Right, joining me are two guests, Ambassador Skand Thayil and Professor Harshwardhan Pant. Ambassador Thayil joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1976. He served at Indian missions in Sofia, Warsaw, Geneva and Moscow. He was India's Consul General in Johannesburg and Houston, and ambassador to Uzbekistan and South Korea. And Professor Pant is Director of Studies and Head of the Strategic Studies Program at the Observer Research Foundation, a New Delhi-based think tank. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on Newsnet. Appreciate it. Let me come to you first, Ambassador Thayil. Now, that report we just showed would have given our viewers a fair idea, a fair sense of what is happening in Hong Kong and why but also help our viewers understand why is Xi Jinping wanting to control Hong Kong now in particular and what does that tell you about Xi Jinping, the man and his politics? The way President Xi Jinping's China is functioning, mm -hmm. they are now baring their teeth. Earlier there was an expectation all over the world that there can be a peaceful rise of China and the right. whole world was ready to accommodate. But now the way China has been functioning all over its periphery, whether it is South China Sea, whether mm -hmm. it is the North Border, Taiwan and Hong Kong also, they just do not want to brook any kind of uh, dissent in any part of China because Hong Kong ultimately is part of China. But there is a issue here the world has to watch that there was after all an agreement and right. China had that agreement with United Kingdom that for 50 years that means up to 2047 mm -hmm. whatever freedoms whatever is the judicial system whatever right. is the legislative system in Hong Kong will continue mm -hmm. and now China has breached that understanding that agreement. So that is a very worrying factor that China which is a major power in the in the world its word cannot be trusted, its signed agreements cannot be trusted, I think, for India and for the rest of the world. That is the bigger story, of course, for the people of Hong Kong. Their much cherished freedoms of expression, freedom of uh, agitation, freedom of, you know, the democratic freedoms that the people have right. are being crushed. And this already, this uh, uh, law, new law was passed yesterday, adopted today, and 370 people, 370 persons have already been arrested today in Hong Kong under these new laws and these new laws the entire judicial system in Hong Kong which will be which was there earlier which was fair and just mm -hmm. and open will be now changed because these uh, people will be tried in closed courts there will be no uh, jury and the judge will be appointed right. by the administrator of Hong Kong who, who is a lady appointed by the Chinese mm -hmm. government. So the entire political process in Hong Kong then has come under the scanner of right. Chinese government, Chinese party and the freedoms of our people of Hong Kong will be severely curtailed. Absolutely. And for the world, the major issue is that an agreement signed by China with UK in 1985 has been breached. All right. I want to take that same question across to Professor Panth. Professor Panth, help our viewers understand the timing for enacting this new security law which overrides and supersedes the domestic law and Chinese security will prevail over Hong Kong for the foreseeable future. So what do you make of the timing? And also, as Ambassador Thayil mentioned, China's so-called peaceful rise. It's a thing of the past, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I think no one buys uh, the peaceful rise argument anymore. And I think as uh, we have seen over the last few months, in fact, China is busy making enemies out of countries that otherwise would have, uh, you know, uh, accepted China's rise uh, as, a, as, a, as a power in the international system. Uh, powers rise and fall. That's the nature of international politics. 
but for China to present itself as a country that is now going to shred uh, to pieces every single agreement that it has signed with every country. Now look at, you know, we are talking in the context of Hong Kong, the, the basic uh, declaration, joint declaration with Britain that it has signed in 1997. Which, uh, which, uh, you know, which argues for one country, two systems model that is now being, uh, you know, being shred to pieces. But also look around, you know, South China Sea. It is, it is unwilling to abide by uh, laws of the sea. It is unwilling to abide by unclause. Uh, with India, what has happened in the recent months, uh, in recent weeks, is an indication that it has, uh, you know, uh, violated every single tenet of India's, uh, every, uh, every single agreement it has signed with India since 1998. Uh, since 1988. So clearly, I think uh, China is too busy in projecting itself as a power that is willing to now shape the global order in its own image. It believes that it is no longer a rising power. It has arrived. It believes that because of that arrival, it can shape its own periphery. It can shape the, the regional order in its own image. And I think for Hong Kongers, this is a moment of Xi Jinping's revenge. Last year, mm -hmm. when they had enacted or tried to enact uh, an extradition law, the Hong Kongers used their democracy, their dissent. They were out on the streets and they made sure that that, uh, that, that uh, act was uh, withdrawn. Now, finally, uh, Xi Jinping has had his revenge by bringing in a national security law that is so harmful, not only uh, for Hong Kongers, but I think to the larger uh, basic value of democracy and dissent which Hong Kongers pride themselves on. This is a, you know, this is a unit that had been incredibly autonomous, incredibly democratic compared to what is there in mainland China and has tried to preserve that. Now, China under Xi wants to make Hong Kong more like its, uh, its own uh, mainland, right. more like mainland. And therefore, I think the question for Hong Kongers and for the rest of the world is whether the rest of the world can stand up to these Chinese shenanigans and project a united stand so that we don't continue to fall into one crisis after another and don't give China Absolutely. and the Chinese Communist Party space to continue to violate right. agreements and continue to shape the regional order in its own image. Indeed.